Um, as I said, my name is uh, Keith Fisk, uh, principal, uh, senior database engineer at Crunchy Data. Um, work on PG Part Man, PG Monitor, an older tool called PG Extractor that I still like, though. Um, so is Crunchy Data. Um, we provide uh, 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 providing enterprise Postgres support and uh, other open, uh, open source solutions around Postgres. Um, Crunchy Postgres is 100% 100 open source PostgreSQL. There's no lock-in to um, any of our PostgreSQL products. Um, and the primary product is Crunchy Postgres, provides high availability, monitoring, um, hardened, which is uh, Postgres with built-in TDE, and some other security features. And we also pro help provide uh, common criteria um, evaluations for Postgres and provide um, common criteria uh, certified versions of Postgres if you're in that sort of a government environment. Um, some other products we also provide are as a, a product around Kubernetes, the Postgres operator, and we have a fully managed Postgres um, uh, 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 on your choice of cloud, AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud uh, called Crunchy Bridge. So we're going to talk about today. Um, oh, sorry. Yes. Do you support the Do I support what? I'm sorry? Crunchy has a Kubernetes operator. Yeah. So uh, today we're talking about what are transaction IDs. I'm not going to get too deep. I'm going to get a little bit deep into it, but not too deep. There is a, a lot to transaction IDs, and I will not get to er the people that know about them. I'm not going to get to every little bit. And, but it's still, going to still seem like a lot and a little bit overwhelming to what I do talk about, but I'll try to be as simple as I can. And we'll talk about the two, the two major gods that I uh, will talk about here, transaction ID exhaustion and bloat, which happens to, seems to be a popular topic on uh, uh, talks this year. Uh, for Postgres. So what are transaction IDs in Postgres? The simplest thing, it's an almost, we'll see why, uh, always increasing 32-bit uh, unsigned integer value inside Postgres. Therefore, it has a maximum value of approximately 4 billion. And Postgres uses a system called multi-version currency control, or MVCC, um, to be able to compare those transaction IDs so it knows um, that's how Postgres is able to handle multiple people doing updates and deletes and inserts at the same time without uh, interfering and col uh, colliding with each other, um, working on the same tuples and rows and things like that. So it does that by comparing these transaction IDs numbers to each other. And in general, um, when, you, when a tuple is inserted, it gets a transaction ID assigned to it, and your session has a transaction ID that, it's, it, that it, it knows where it's at in the transaction that you're running. And with the insertion ID is greater than the current transaction ID, that means that that one's in the future. That means that's somebody else's transaction that ran, that they updated that row, and you should not be able to see that one yet because it's greater than your transaction ID. And then if a tuple has an insertion ID um, less than the current one, that means it should be visible to you. It's in the past somewhere. And then a tuple, if it gets a deletion um, a, a transaction ID assigned to it, that means it's gone from the database, and you kind of flip that, flip that around then. So if it's greater than that, it should, not be vis it should be visible to you. And if it's less than, it should not be visible to you anymore, because that means somebody deleted it before your current transaction state. So how do you see these things inside Postgres? Well, these, one of the easiest ways, um, every table has hidden columns in it. Um, these are some of the hidden columns. Um, there's the xmin. That's the insertion transaction ID I was telling you about. So a tuple has a, when a tuple is inserted, it gets that insertion transaction ID assigned to it at that time. Everybody after that should now be able to see that, uh, that tuple based on that transaction ID. When a row is updated or deleted, because an update in Postgres is, an insert, uh, is a delete and insert, um, it gets an xmax assigned to it, and that means it's a deleted tuple. Nobody, should, nobody after this transaction ID should be able to see it anymore. But if you're still before that one, you should still be able to see it. Um, there are cmin and cmax as well. That's if you're within your own transaction. How does Postgres keep that visibility and stuff unknown? Um, that's, so uh, same, same principle applies. It's just within your own transaction. And I figured I'd throw another one of the CT, uh, hidden columns up there just because it's interesting. It doesn't really have anything to do with the transaction management. Um, but the CTID is the physical location of a row uh, within the table. Um, uh, you can that is a way you can use for trying to remove duplicate rows. If you're trying to, I want to keep one row, but want to get rid of all the other ones, you can say delete anything not equal to this CTID. We'll get rid of all the other rows that uh, match on all the other values. Um, but it's not something you generally want to use as any kind of unique identifier for a row because it can change. If the table rewrites, if you update the row, it gets new CTIDs and stuff assigned to it. So you don't want to use it as an identifier or anything like that. So 
a little bit more about transaction at ease. So like I said, though, that visibility stuff was kind of in general. Um, there are uh, transaction isolation levels in Postgres. I'm not going to get too deep into that on, on the talk today. But basically, there's, there are things that uh, let you see other people's committed transactions depending on the isolation level you have. So there are, it is a little bit more complicated than I made it seem at first. But, um, so how does the comparison work? So for normal transaction IDs, they're compared using modulo 32 arithmetic. That basically means that they're for every one, for your transaction ID, there's 2 billion transaction IDs before you and 2 billion transaction IDs after you. Um, so newer. So that means you have like a maximum of about 2 billion transactions ahead of you that can exist at any one time. Uh, and what, what I mean by normal transaction IDs, we'll see later, there are other transaction IDs that are like, there's a frozen one we'll talk about here shortly, and, uh, and, and initial ones and invalid ones, those are kind of static and you don't really have to do the, the modulo arithmetic around that kind of stuff in that case. Um, but I will say, if you get these slides and there's a, if, if anything I'm talking about today you really want to dive into more is this last link right here. If you're going to be a PostgreSQL administrator, not necessarily an application user and all that kind of stuff, not really too important there, but if you're going to be administering a Postgres database, I will say this is probably one of the most important pieces of documentation to try and understand, especially around this transaction ID management stuff and the topic I'm going to talk about here shortly. So um, number can't go on forever, right? It's, a, it's got a maximum value. How does Postgres manage that sort of thing? So one of, uh, one of the tools in Postgres is vacuum. Um, it's, a, it's a background process in Postgres, and one of the things it does is when a row is, is deleted or updated, how does it get marked those old rows and things like that, or, um, sorry about that, any of the, any of the new rows that when, they, when they get inserted, um, this vacuum process goes through, and if it sees that no other transaction could possibly see, need to see, like, uh, it's, every other transaction should be able to see this row, the vacuum process is able to mark it as frozen. That means it should be visible to every possible uh, transaction that sh could, could ever be running again. And that means they can let the, the number go on forever because it's just, it's marked as frozen, which is a very, very small number in the past. Um, but modern versions of Postgres actually don't reset that number anymore. Um, Postgres 9.4 and earlier actually used to actually set the xmin value. So this value would be set back down to two. That's the frozen uh, transaction ID number. Um, but mo modern versions of Postgres are a little bit more efficient, and they just set a bit flag, and it says this tuple's frozen and moves on with that. Um, the thing is, uh, Postgres cannot freeze a row if there's any open transactions that are using that row at that time. So um, that's why you want to monitor for long-running transactions in Postgres, because it doesn't let vacuum do this process of cleaning up the old rows and marking them as frozen so it can avoid the whole exhaustion issue at some point. Um, modern versions of Postgres can actually also set that frozen bit, so it's on each tuple has a bit, but every page in Postgres can also have a bit, and that lets Postgres be able to skip over the entire page and not have to examine it anymore. It means that entire page is visible to any possible transaction. Let's vacuum run even more efficiently um, than before. So uh, what happens after billions and billions and billions of transactions with no freezing? Um, we run into the first Elder God, so trying to think of the worst Elder God of all the Lovecraftian ones out there, and Azathoth is the one that came up. So in addition to waking Azathoth and ending the universe, as you know it, your database is on fire now, so you're a DB admin, you have your priorities, you have to work in your database while the universe is ending. So um, transaction ID exhaustion. Like I said, the, the normal XID space is circular with no endpoint. Otherwise, how would a database run for years and years and years on end with that limit of, a, of, an, of an integer value? Um, so people, when you hear about this, people often talk about wraparound being the problem. Wraparound isn't the actual problem. It, it's part of the problem, but the Postgres can wrap around fine. As long as, there's a, as long as there's unused transaction IDs somewhere in that space, it's fine. The wraparound is okay to happen. The problem is when it runs out of those future IDs. And, when it, and then when wraparound happens at that point, because it's out of numbers to go to, that's the bad part. So suddenly everything that was, um, uh, that was uh, sorry, suddenly transactions, are, everything that was in the past is suddenly in the future. That means if it's in the future, that means you're not supposed to see it yet, right? So your entire database is invisible when this happens. So when this happens, um, they're, there, they're still there. This is not a data loss event. 
Um, there was a little bit of a, a story of, of some big cloud provider that ran into this wraparound problem and some people were saying there was data loss. There was no data loss. It was unavailable for a long extended period of time. So Postgres, to prevent data loss, and so if something, if, if the wraparound was actually happening and writes started happening to the database, there is a possibility of data loss then. So if, when, when this event happens, Postgres shuts the database down, and unless you force it, you cannot start the database in anything but a single user mode. And you have to go in there, run some vacuums, clean things up, and then you can bring your database and stuff back up. So Postgres is safe in most cases to even running into this event um, to help you prevent that data loss and things like that. So to avoid this, um, it's necessary to run vacuum on every table in every database at least once every two billion transactions. You cannot run a Postgres UL database without vacuuming. You can disable auto vacuum, and there are valid reasons for doing that. You need to run vacuum at specific times of the day to avoid load and things like that. That's fine. Disabling auto vacuum is not a problem. That means the problem is now on your shoulders to manage, um, which is it, it's like it's okay. You just have to manage it at some point. So um, talking about transaction aids, um, you can you can look at this stuff. So example in the PG database system catalog. Um, you can see there's, I have a couple, of my, uh, this is my next cloud database that I run on Postgres. Um, so there's the dat frozen ID is a column. That's, that's the lower bound of the uh, uh, unfrozen transaction IDs in a given table. So I, that is the oldest unvacuumed tuple. It hasn't been marked as frozen or anything like that. So you run this age function against that, uh, that column, and it computes the, 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 the um, the given value compared to the current normal transaction ID. So that's what uh, TX ID is the current transaction. So I ran age on the dat frozen ID. So if you look at this va uh, the value, uh, was it 136 or 1,336,000, that minus 720, you get that age value. So that's how you're monitoring for this thing, is you're watching for that age. Um, this is a little bit, I'll show you easier ways to monitor for that, but this is, if you're trying to get visibility into this kind of stuff, um, this is where you can look at that. So what you're wanting to watch for is that age approaching 2 billion. That's what you're wanting to monitor for in this case. So what does Postgres do to try to help handle this automatically? Um, there is a, uh, uh, a setting called auto vacuum freeze max age. And when uh, a, a, tuple, a, a table with the oldest tuple reaches auto vacuum freeze max age, Postgres what runs what people have dubbed an emergency auto vacuum on it. And you will see this if you run it on, if you run a query on PG stat activity, you'll see this as a process um, uh, that's running. You'll have that in parentheses to prevent wraparound. So that means that table reached this auto vacuum freeze max age. It has a default value of 200 million, so that's well below the 2 million mark. So Postgres is trying to, trying to keep ahead of this and, and act on it. Um, but this vacuum is a little bit more aggressive. A normal auto vacuum um, uh, will uh, skips over pages that uh, have no dead tuples in them. Even if they're unfrozen, it'll kind of skip over them just for efficiency. Um, but the, this aggressive vacuum aggressively goes and tries to hit all of the unfrozen tuples in every page in the, in the table. So it's a little more aggressive. And uh, this also runs even if you disable auto vacuum. So it doesn't let you shoot yourself in the foot completely when you disable auto vacuum. Um, uh, thank you, Peter Gagan reminded me of this other um, newer feature in uh, Postgres 14. So this just comes for free. You get Postgres 14, you get this other um, age value that's in there um, that runs, again, another more kind of uh, aggressive uh, emergency auto vacuum. And this one ignores something called cost delay, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, and also skips index vacuuming to try to be a little bit more aggressive on table vacuuming. And it has a value of 1.6 billion. So still well below the 2 billion mark, and hopefully you're on Postgres 14 or higher, you're less of a, running into less of a chance of that wraparound event happening. There are some other things that can cause this to happen. I'm not going to get too deep into that. But again, that same page that I recommended you read before has all of those other instances of where this can happen in it. So um, any questions so far at all? OK. So how do you monitor for that? This is a scary looking query here at first, but I'll try to explain it a little bit. Um, this is an example of a CTE query, a common table expression. And basically it has three parts. The first one is just kind of gathering information. I'm setting, I'm setting this, uh, this, this column by this max um, old transaction ID to 2 billion. That's, that's our high watermark for our alerting. 
it's the actual value is the 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 the, unsi the, the, the signed integer maximum, so it's 2.1 billion something. So we're keeping it below that. And then we're also getting the value of auto vacuum freeze max age and storing that. Then we're going on to the next part of it, the PG database status. And so now we're gathering what the information is on each of the databases in our database. So we're getting the database name. We're pulling things from that first max age table, just bringing it along with it. And we're getting that age of that DAT frozen ID of that. So the oldest unvacuumed row in are in that database we're bringing along in here. And then the last one, we're just doing some math on it. So we're getting the oldest current transaction ID, which is the first one. Um, the next one is, we're, then we're doing a percentage towards wraparound, and then a percentage towards that emergency auto vacuum. So we end up getting very simple. So that complicated query gets you this very simple metric to watch for a percentage towards wraparound and a percentage towards um, emergency auto vacuum. Yes, you have a question. Is there a way to bake it or force that so you could test your monitoring like on a test data basis or a data source? Yeah, there are, there are, so yes, if there's a way to test this sort of a thing. Um, I don't have any examples of it, but if you, if you look for, there's, there's um, sets of queries you can run that will rapidly increase the transaction ID value and, of course, disable autovac and all that kind of stuff to see what happens. Yeah, there's, there's examples of query sets you can run out there that will just rapidly fly through your transaction IDs. Yeah. So our thresholds here, um, we actually set the emergency status to not 100%, but a little bit higher than that. So I do 110% for warning, 125% for critical. That's because reaching 100% isn't really a bad thing. Um, that's, going, that's going to happen in a normal running of a database over a long-term period of time. It's going to happen eventually. Um, it's if Postgres exceeds that value and doesn't keep up with it. So if we're going over 100% and never coming down and continuing to go higher and higher and higher, that's the problem. That's what we want to keep ahead of. So if you resolve the emergency threshold, you will never run into wraparound exhaustion because that's what, this is well ahead of that point. So if you're able to monitor and act on it then, you'll never run into the problem um, in that case. And then we set our wraparound threshold significantly lower. I usually actually set it to sometimes like 50% or 60% for a warning uh, to keep well ahead of it. So um, I will say if you're, if you are setting up any sort of monitoring for Postgres, no matter what it is, this is at, at minimum one of the me metrics that should be there. Um, this is a critical metric for Postgres to monitor. If your monitoring solution doesn't have it, find a way to add it. If you can't add it, find another monitoring solution. So now your database is all nice and frozen, and, uh, and, and you've got the old, got Azathoth back to sleep again somehow. So any questions on that so far? Okay. So um, what, are the, what are some of the other things that Vacuum does inside the database? Um, row cleanup. This is what Vacuum is actually most, actually most known for. The other thing that I talk about is actually the lesser known thing that Vacuum helps to manage. This is what Vacuum is mostly known for. Um, as I said, uh, a delete in Postgres um, doesn't actually remove anything. It actually just marks the row as unavailable or dead. It sets that X max value for that tuple. That means it's unavailable to any future transactions. That's all that happens when you do a delete in Postgres. Um, and as I said, an update internally is just a delete and an insert. It marks the old row with an X max value and it inserts a new tuple or new row with an X, a higher X min value at that point. So what Vacuum does is it goes back through and finds all those dead tuples and, and marks those as available space. So new rows and tuples uh, come in. It's going to use those, uh, that, that space uh, for the new stuff that's coming in. So the term bloat then is typically what uh, the, the dead tuples plus the available space on a given table. And so if you want to, and if you want to see that if there are any dead tuples on a given table, um, you can look at the system catalog pgstat all tables. There is pgstat user tables. Um, user tables are what it says. Those are the tables that users create. Um, transaction ID exhaustion and bloat and all that kind of thing is, is important for system catalogs as well. So if you're looking at this kind of stuff, you actually want to look at pgstat all tables because you want to look at this for the system catalogs as well. So um, excessive bloat on a, da on a data uh, table can cause heavier I, uh, uh, IO on that system. 
because the smallest amount of data the Postgres can return is a page, so by default 8K. It's not going to return anything less than that. So if your data is thinly spread across many, many, many pages, um, it has to pull all of those pages back to, get, to even get the smallest amount of data out of them. So you kind of want to compact that data, defrag the data down into as few pages as possible, so you're as efficiently as possible pulling that data out of the database. But not all bloat is bad either. If a table is, he is heavily updated um, or heavy heavily deleted, you want to have that available space in the table for the new rows that are coming in because that's less the Postgres has to go and talk to the underlying file system and ask it for more space. So you're going to have to try and find a balance um, in that kind of thing. So I would, I would say a good, a good rule of thumb is usually like around 50, 50 to 60 percent bloat on a table. You want to start taking a look at it. You may not have to act on it. If you're not seeing any performance problems as far as you're concerned, you don't have to fix it um, if you're not having a problem. It's not one of those things that uh, is, is really a problem. In, you can act on it if you want to stay ahead of it, if you know it's going to be a problem in the future. But if it's not a problem at the time and you don't have the capacity to fix it, you don't have to fix it at that time. Um, so. But now your bloat is rising. Uh, we've got Cthulhu coming out of the deep. Um, seemed like the fitting god for bloat. Um, so how do you monitor for things like bloat? Um, I consider this the old way. There are still a lot of monitoring tools that still, that still do it this way. And um, uh, the per so this is the query from uh, the Czech Postgres. Uh, if, you, or if you go to the wiki, the Postgres UL wiki, or the, the Nagios Czech Postgres module, um, you'll find this query in there is much more complex than this. It's probably like three times, four times longer than this. It's a very, very complex query. But it gives you an instant result back um, uh, uh, on what the bloat is. But I have seen it be wildly inaccurate. And the, the author of this query works here, Crunchy, Greg Mullane. He's like, yes, that's my query. I'm sorry. But it works for the most part. Um, and it will find, I will say, in my opinion, probably 75 to 80% it'll solve the problems. When I ran into it where I started looking into this myself more was I deleted over 300 million rows out of a table, analyzed it, vacuumed it, analyzed it again. Postgres still said 2% bloat. I, I couldn't figure out why. Out of the statistics, nobody I could talk to could figure out why. It's just what's, whatever this query is doing wasn't finding, wasn't seeing it in the statistics somehow, and I couldn't, I couldn't figure out why. So I talked to some people at conferences. That's why I'm glad the conferences are happening again, because that's how I found out about this tool. Um, this is actually an extension that comes with the Postgres uh, contrib module. This comes with Postgres as a, uh, um, it's called the contrib modules. It's usually a separate package, or you have to compile it separately. But it is maintained by the Postgres core team. And so what this does, it just, it's a, like, it, like it says, it provides statistics for the tuples and indexes um, in a given table. And so it, one of the things it shows you is free space and dead space um, for tables and B-tree indexes. Um, it does provide statistics for other index types and things like that, like gin indexes, excuse me, and gist indexes, but it doesn't provide any sort of bloat info. I have no idea how to find bloat and gin and just indexes. I've, I haven't been able to find that myself. Um, but I don't know if it's really a problem for them either. So um, it does a full table scan of, of, the, of the table to give you actual accurate statistics. So um, this can take a while for large tables and large indexes. Um, so, but it gives you the accurate information uh, that you're actually looking for. Um, it does have an approximate function as well. Um, so it reports accuracy on dead tuples, and it does an estimate on the live and free space. So it's a little bit, uh, it's actually significantly quicker for some large tables, um, but it's not quite as accurate as, as the full table scan. Um, and if you're using this tool directly, um, you have to target the individual table or each individual index. So if your table has 15 indexes, you got to call this once for the table and once for and 15 more times for each index, so it can get a little tedious. And it actually doesn't include the toast table. So uh, Postgres, um, I always forget what toast stands for. It's the uh, oversize, I forget. So if, if, the, if, a, if the size of, a, of your data in a column is over, is over 8K, over the size of a page, Postgres will actually store it outside of the table in something called a toast table. It compresses it, stores it outside in a secondary table. 
still visible when you query the normal table. It's just something Postgres is doing underneath the table. But I actually didn't learn, I didn't know that this wasn't scanning the, the toast table until well after I developed the next tool I'm going to talk about for actually years. So I was missing, I was missing a lot of bloat. And that may have been where something in that other query wasn't seeing things. It might have been toast related or something like that. So, um, but this is what the result of PGStat tuple looks like um, against the table. Um, this is obviously a very, very small table. It's an eight, uh, the smallest thing anything can be is 8K. So this is an 8K table. And you can see the tuple length, the tuple percent. So that's the live, uh, actual live counts. And you can see the dead, the dead count, how much free space there is. And uh, so this, it, you can see this is a very, very high free space count. But it's a very, very small table. So there's no reason to go aggressively vacuuming this thing because you're never going to get it. This is never going to decrease. So again, if you're just kind of blindly going in there and scanning for bloat, you're going to come in here and see this thing is 90% bloated. Not really. So. Another thing you can look at is a, uh, there's a thing called free space map. Um, it's another extension. Um, it has some functions to show you uh, uh, the approximate free space. So each, each row returned is a page in the table, and it gives you about how much free space um, is available on there. And it's not, this is not kept up to date real time. This is another thing that Vacuum does. So Vacuum is now updating the visibility maps, cleaning up rows, updating the, the free space map as well. So Vacuum is, is, is very, very, a very, very multitasking tool um, in that case. So um, your bloat's still rising. How can you, it's, you're kind of panicking. How can you monitor for this in an easier way? This is a tool that I, it's a, it's a Python script I wrote um, to report table and B-tree bloat. Um, it uses the PG stat tuple extension. So I'm, I'm not doing anything really fancy here in this case. I'm just kind of running PG stat tuple over and over again. But you give it a table name, and it goes through, and it scans the table, all of the indexes, all of the toast tables that may be associated with it, reports it back individually, the table versus the toast table. It also accounts for another thing called fill factor in Postgres. So every page in Postgres, for a table, by default, Postgres, the fill factor is set to 100. That means it's going to try to fill every page it can to 100%, if at all possible. Indexes have a 90% fill factor. They leave about 10% free, because indexes are often update, ind index entries are often updated. So it's better to have a little bit of free space right there in the page available. Um, that's actually something you can set. If a, if a table has frequent updates, um, you can basically lower the fill factor setting on that to, to a lower value to force there to be free space in every page to help updates run more efficiently inside Postgres. And also do something called, um, Postgres can do something called a heap only tuple update. Um, that means, so every time you would update a row, if there's an index, it would have to go and update that index as well. If there's free space in the page for the new tuple, Postgres can actually put that, free, that new value inside the same page and do a link from the old value to the new value and not have to update the index. So you can make your um, updates run tremendously faster by taking advantage of that fill factor setting. And I've, account, I've tried to account for tables that fill factor is not bloat and that you would want to have to worry about. So I don't consider it bloat um, in this sort of case either. So um, you can scan the entire database. You can scan target tables. Um, I, uh, there's a bunch of filters in there, so I usually, I usually don't recommend running it if, if, it, if a table is less than a gigabyte. Just don't even worry about it. If, it, if, it's less, if a table is less than a gigabyte, Postgres is probably going to manage it fairly well. Even if it's like 90% bloated, you're probably not going to be seeing a lot of problems in that case. Um, so you can kind of exclude those right off the bat. And then you can also exclude things on a per table basis. Um, there are cases where you'll run into even very, very large tables. Just the, the, the churn rate on that table will get to like 60 or 70 percent. We have a few, a few clients like that right now. They're, they're like 200, 300 million row tables, but they stay at around 60 to 70 percent bloat, no matter how many times they vacuum them. They go vacuum full it. Next week, it's back up to 70 percent again, but it stays there. And it doesn't grow in size. It just stays right around that part. So you can do a filter. If you know you're not, you're not, you're not going to have to worry about that table, you can put a filter in there to say, exclude this table when the bloat is 70% or lower and not bigger than, say, like 5 gigabytes. So if it starts growing again, that would be a problem, even if it's 70%. So you can uh, very, very fine grain filtering. 
And uh, like I said, this, can, this uses PGSTAT tuple, so it can take a while to actually scan the whole database. I think uh, my experience in the past, about a, a terabyte or so database would probably take about 45 minutes to an hour to actually scan. All depends on what the data is and stuff like that, but that's just been my experience. So not really practical for real-time querying on, on things like that. So this tool stores the results in a table, which then your monitoring can just watch that table for the result and then not have to wait on the, the table scans and stuff to happen. So, um, any, any questions about uh, monitoring for bloat in that case? Or the PGSTAT tuple? Yes? Well, I mean, if, uh, so he's asking how does, uh, if, the, if the row is removed, and, and you talk about the heap-only tuple update. If the row is completely removed, then, yeah, it's going to go and, and remove the entry out of the index. But if it's, if it's an update, it just keeps the values linking forward. For every update to that row, if it's on the same page, it just keeps the link chain going. And the index entry goes to the no first one it knew about and follows, it follows along to the latest value. If it's completely removing it, then, yeah, it removes the entry from the index at that point. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So let's talk about some vacuum tuning. So um, these are, the, these are the, 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 two, the two older gods I talked about today. They're both managed by vacuuming. So how can we um, uh, manage uh, tuning our, our vacuuming in this case? So um, this is from the PG settings. Um, uh, system catalog, just name, setting. So the name is obviously the name of the setting. And these are, mo I think these are mostly default values. They may have some um, non-default values in here, but in any case, if you go look at this, you may not have default values in yours either um, in some cases. So the first one, you can see auto vacuum on or off. That's what you're, this is for the, the setting for the entire uh, cluster in this case. So in, by default is on, and most of the time should be on. But you can disable it on an individual table basis and stuff as well. Um, but we'll talk about each one of these things here. So auto vacuum freeze max age. I already talked about that. That's the controls when that emergency um, wraparound vacuum is going to run. If you have a very, very busy database, you may consider um, very, uh, busy as, as in a transaction rate sort of a thing. You may consider increasing this just to give Postgres's normal vacuum processes more time to do their normal thing. Because um, if, you, if, you, if you find yourself constant with tables constantly hitting the auto vacuum freeze max age, that may be a, a time you may want to consider um, increasing it. If you're, if you're increasing it, I would say you can increase it to about a billion. That's still about halfway to the bad point. You're probably still fine. I find if you're, if you're having to increase it a higher than a billion, you may want to investigate why vacuum's not keeping up on your database in that sort of a case. So. Um, but you can see uh, back here, our default value is at the 200 million uh, row, uh, value there. Um, vacuum freeze table age. So like I said, there's some other things that can cause that uh, aggressive uh, vacuum to, to, to kick in. So this is just saying um, uh, if, if the, I'm trying, trying to think. So the table hasn't reached auto vacuum freeze max age, but there's still old tuples that are building up inside the, inside the table. This is another thing that can uh, trigger that more aggressive vacuum. But it doesn't show up as that wraparound vacuum in PGSTAT activity. So this is just another thing you can kind of watch for. Um, what was that? I'm trying to remember what vacuum freeze max age. I didn't include it in here. So yeah, um, don't have to worry about that one too much. But if you're curious, there's other things. I was saying there's other things that can trigger that aggressive vacuuming. That's one of them. Um, you don't really have to worry about it too much. Um, but what, when, what actually triggers auto vacuum to run? That's what these next couple settings are, are for. So there's auto, vac, auto vacuum, vacuum, and analyze scale factor. So what this is saying when this percentage of the table has been updated or deleted, kick off a vacuum. So it defaults to um, see our, our uh, vacuum scale factor is 0.2. So that's about 20%. So when 20% of the table has had updates or deletes to it, kick off an auto vacuum. For analyze, it's down to 0.1, so about 10%. So you want the analyze to run a little bit more fit fast, more often than the, um, than the vacuum, obviously. And then the other thing is the threshold. So this is an actual number of rows that have changed in a given table. 
So, um, and what actually triggers the auto vacuum is the scale factor plus the threshold. When that number of rows has changed, then run the auto vacuum. Uh, the reason for the threshold there is to avoid vacuuming those tiny little tables that you saw. So I only have like, I only have like four or five rows in this tiny little table. I don't need auto vacuum kicking off every time one table is updated in it. So it's going to wait. I think the default is uh, 50. I usually increase that to like 500 or 1,000 as a default. So um, it's not ag aggressively auto vacuuming really tiny tables all the time. And then um, that's a Postgres 13 and higher. So the tricky part was insert only tables in the past. Um, this was the, these two other two things were only updates and updates and deletes. What if you have an insert only table? You're not worried about old rows, but you're still worried about that X-min, that insertion transaction ID value running out at some point. So th these new uh, uh, options were, were added into Postgres. Prior to this, it would reach the auto vacuum freeze max age on your insert only tables, then the vacuum would kick off. If you have a lot of insert only tables, you suddenly have a lot of tables all getting vacuumed at the same time, which is why you don't want to be reaching auto vacuum freeze max age um, in a lot of cases. So now you can tune your insert tables to, to um, get vacuumed more efficiently as well. And then there's also, uh, or any, any questions about any of, any of those. So this is what triggers auto vacuum to run and, in a lot of cases. And this is what you're going to be, these are the values you're going to be tuning and things like that. So any questions? Yes. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so there's any recommendations for cost delay tuning. So yep. So yeah, auto va audio vacuum resource usage. So um, if we go back and we can go back and look at the, the previous table. You can see there's these uh, uh, vacuum cost delay, vacuum cost limit, um, cost dirty page, cost page hit, all those kinds of values. So um, the cost page dirty, cost page hit, cost page miss, um, these are points that are accumulating while vacuum is running. So, okay. Uh, the uh, cost, uh, the, so the dirty is the most expensive. You can see it's set at about 20. And then the um, page hit is one and page miss is two. So these are building up while vacuum is running. Um, and then there's a cost limit, which is, uh, look back here, is 200. So when all of these things are running and hits that 200 mark, that triggers what's called a cost delay. And that I believe the delay value is uh, auto vacuum, auto vacuum cost delay. Where's that? Uh, two. So um, that's two milliseconds. So all of these costs are building up. When it caught, when it reaches the cost limit of 200, if auto vacuum pauses for two milliseconds, then continues. Waits for the cost to build up. This is why an auto vacuum seems slower than a regular vacuum because a regular vacuum has no cost limit. Um, and this is also that that uh, that, that fail safe um, 1.6 billion value I'd heard told you about before also has no cost limit to it. So as far as tuning, you can do this on a per table basis, um, uh, which is what we're talking, the last thing I'll talk about here is per table tuning. Um, so th these, are, these are the database wide settings here. Um, you, can, you can tune these on a, on a, on a database wide scale. You want to kind of tune those for a more general use case, though, um, for, for most things. If you're going to really get down and start tuning things, you want to tune these on a per table basis. Um, and all of these, these settings I talked about here, all of these settings um, and all of these settings can all be done on a per table basis. So if you have a table that needs some more aggressive vacuuming, needs to have less cost delay on it, you need, you need it to run more aggressively on a given table and not wait so long, you can tune that on, a, on an ind individual table basis. And I would, I would say the first thing you probably want to look at tuning is that cost limit. Um, maybe increase that a little bit if you're seeing it's not keeping up or decrease the cost delay from two to one or like uh, 1, uh, 1.5 or something like that. You really don't want to be adjusting the, co the, uh, the, paid, the page hit values or the, the actual the cost page values. You kind of want to tune the limit and the, and the delay on a, on a given table. So um, I'm talking about here. So, what, and so the way to do this is to, uh, to tune it on a per table basis is to figure out your tuple change rate for a given table. So this is the uh, PG stat all tables for this one of these tables in my next cloud um, instance. And so just basically do a select star from this for this table, dump it out to a CSV file. Like do it on like an hourly basis for like two or three weeks or something like that. Get a, get a, a good 
set of, of, of values that you can go in and evaluate. Um, you determine your hourly, daily, weekly change on your, the, the, so the ntoop delete and ntoop update. Those are your insert uh, deletes and updates on a given table. Sorry. Um, for insert only tables, you're going to look at that in, ntoop insert value. And, and what you're going to do in this case is you're going to set the scale, you're going to set the scale factor to zero. So that percentage value, you don't care about anymore. You want to do this based on the exact number of rows that have been changing in a given table. So you set the table scale factor to zero, and you set the threshold value to what your objective is. How often do you want to try to have auto vacuum run? So in my example here, we got about 20,000 updates a day, 30,000 deletes a day. So about 50,000 or so changes on that table every day. We want vacuum to run once a week on this table. Multiply that value by seven, set that to your threshold. Should, if that is about your average value, it, it could be more, it could be less, but you're trying to target about what it wanted to be. Analyze, you want to run more frequently. Maybe twice a day, more often, all depend on how, how, uh, how often your queries need to be, have their statistics up to date. So maybe cut that value in half, set that to the analyze threshold, now your analyze should be running at least twice a day. So um, is it working? So um, go back into this table here, uh, sorry, um, and see if your ntup delete value. Um, is that a relatively no, low number? Or is it just not, is it, is it not going down? Is it a very high number? That can mean auto vacuum is not keeping up or running at all on that table. So that's how to keep an eye on there. Um, and, uh, number of uh, tables modified since the last analyze, that'll tell you if you're hitting your analyze target um, based on the threshold. Um, insert since vacuum for an insert only table, that'll tell you uh, if you're hitting your insert uh, threshold. Um, and then there's, there's a, a day and time or a timestamp value there for your last auto vacuum, last auto analyze, that'll tell you if you're hitting that, that time mark of once, uh, once a week, twice a day, the last time that the, the service ran. And then if you're curious about those hot updates that I talked to you about, if you want to see if they're actually being effective on a table, there's uh, the number of uh, hot updates that have been happened on a given table um, are also tracked there, so you can keep an eye on that. So hopefully everything's working. You haven't, uh, the Cthulhu's yelling at you to release him, but you're keeping him contained. Um, and so, summary of the talk here. Um, I know it was, it was probably, if, if, it's, if it's new to you, it's very, it might seem, seem overly complicated. Believe me, it was to me for a very long time. It took me a long time to get my head wrapped around this. That one page of the documentation, reading that over and over again, going and applying it to what I'm doing, um, really helped me to understand it. But the basics of this are transaction IDs, or how Postgres is managing the data visibility in there. And you want to have any sort of monitoring solution that you have out there, you want to monitor for that metric at a minimum, um, as far as administration goes. And for exhaustion and bloat, um, they're not going to happen right away, especially unless, you're, unless you have a really, really, really busy database right off the bat. You probably won't see these problems for years, if ever. But they, could, they, they may eventually come up. And if, but if you get on top of it now, when it's not a problem, then it will never be a problem. So. Um, Thank you. That's my talk. Um, so bloat seemed to be a popular, top, popular topic this year. <laughs> so we actually have two more talk, talks tomorrow um, about bloat. Uh, Peter Gagan will probably be, a, if, if I know his talks, will be a very, very technical talk on bloat and how it's managed. And um, I, haven't, I have not met Chase, Chelsea Dole before, but she is actually doing a talk specifically on, on bloat, sim very similar to the last half of uh, the talk that I did today, uh, also tomorrow as well. Um, so that's where these slides are, some other links, um, some credit for the artwork. If you haven't seen Love, Death, and Robots on Netflix, that's where that last little bit came from. Highly recommend watching that. So, um, I'll pass the mic around, but in the meantime, I have a question, Keith. And is that, sure. are, is the monitoring for this built into the PG Monitor yes. tool? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so if you want to see a, a, a pr practical example of this monitoring, um, the tool that Crunchy provides PG Monitor, um, uses Prometheus and exporters, and we have some examples. That, that query that I had up here is the exact query that we have in PG Monitor to monitor for, for uh, a wraparound. Back there. Hey, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, can we tune the auto vacuum for, to prevent uh, wraparound? I'm sorry? Can we tune the auto vacuum job 
to prevent uh, wraparound? Uh, so that's kind of what the, the the last bit of this tuning kind of was. Like if you're if if you're if you're trying to uh, tune like specific table, if like a specific table is causing you a problem of reaching the wraparound value, you can go in here and do the same kind of tuning. You want to you want to have vacuum running at a specific a specific number of times a week per day to keep ahead of things. You can do that. If you want to do it on a on a database wide level, you can go in here and start tuning these on a database wide level. So auto vacuum is what's controlling and, and keeping the, and freezing the tuples. So these are the things to, to tune to, to try to prevent the wraparound. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you've talked about like avoiding wakening the elder gods. Yes. Uh, do you have any brief points of advice of what you do once they start to wake up? For example, you start getting the warnings in the Postgres logs about impending wraparound. Um, so what you'll, the, the thing you'll, the, probably one of the first things you'll see is uh, that right there in your pgstat activity. So if you want to monitor pgstat activity for that being in the, in the running query, that will let you know when that is running. And when you see that, that's, uh, the, so the thing to do is to go in there and start looking at the eight, the, you want to find, so first you'll sp see which table has the oldest value. So that's the database you're going to go, I'm sorry, first you want to see which database has the oldest value. So that's going to be the one you're going to go target. And then you can actually query this on an individual table basis as well and find out which table has the oldest XID value in it. And then you can target vacuuming those tables with those oldest transaction ID values in them. So if you have the resources, I would say just go vacuum the whole table, the whole database. Just kick off of a vac vacuum DBs dash dash all, hit everything, if you're able to do that. That would be the easy, that's the easiest solution, just go vacuum the whole thing. If you can't do that, um, try to figure out which, which of the tables is, is the problem and target that one and start vacuuming it first and work your way down from there. Okay. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you so much, Keith. Off the record. <laughs> Super appreciate, great talk. Thank you. So the slides are there if, somebody, if anybody wants to get them, but I think they'll be on the, uh, the SCALE website later as well. <laughs>